eyes of people in the 1850s, well, they often said he was kind of hard on the eyes. Yeah. And he knew it himself. I mean, in fact, he made jokes about his own physical appearance. He looked like a scarecrow that had run off from the cornfield. Right. And when a photographer on one occasion told him, just look natural, Lincoln's reply was, that's what I'm trying to avoid. <laughs> so Lincoln certainly looked funny and sounded funny. Douglas had this rolling baritone voice he sounded like the way we think Lincoln ought to sound, speaking from his chair there in the, in the Lincoln Memorial. In fact, Lincoln had a shrill, piercing tenor voice and a, and a strong Midwestern twang to go you along know, with it. You know, people ask me about Lincoln's voice almost as often as they ask me about yeah. his sexual preference and his Marfan syndrome, but sticking to the question of voice, it did not sound like Alan and I may sound to you, the baritone, and I'm crediting myself with falling into the tenor range. There may be an argument about that. The fact is We could that try the duet from the Pearl <laughs> Fishers. Uh. The truth of the matter is that Lincoln had a, a, a strong enough voice to be a professional politician and a professional attorney. I think we don't often give him, it's not a credit, but we don't acknowledge that he could be heard, whatever yes. the accent. I mean, the funny thing about... Pavarotti voice, maybe. Yeah. Not the accent, but the voice. The funny thing about that distinction is that what would normally seem to be a liability actually turned out to be an asset for Lincoln because that high-pitched voice was also very penetrating. Yes. And he could be heard easily and distinctly by very large crowds over very large distances and to do it without effort, too. And which fellow ended the debates with a hoarse voice and a cold? Exactly. Douglas is the man with the big baritone voice, but the big baritone voice wears out very yeah. quickly. And it's not helped by the fact that midway through the campaign, he comes down with a cold, which looks for all the world like bronchitis, which in turn he proceeds to self-medicate with, well, some of the more popular self-medications of the day. Yeah, you, that's right. Now, you yeah. make the, ca you make Brandy, the point in whiskey, the book. Brandy, right, yeah. You make the case that that he drank increasingly heavily during the campaign. Yeah. You, so you'd think that is true. Well, I think it's true because there are so many people who observe this. Even Lincoln himself makes a joke about it. Uh, his wife, Adele Douglas, uh, went around on most of the circuit of the debates with him. And people raised their eyebrows at this, not because there was anything mystifying about Adele. I mean, Adele was a beauty. beauty. She was a great Absolutely. asset to, uh, to Douglas. Uh, but people raised their eyebrows because Mary did not go around on the debate circuit. She was actually present only for the last of the seven debates. Lincoln's response to that was, well, I do not need my wife to go around with me and keep me sober. <laughs> so there are, there are a number of people who observe that Douglas is starting to drink pretty now that heavily during that rather campaign. cruel line of Lincoln's calls to mind an issue that one I think we both deal with often, which is the myth of Lincoln's and Douglas's alleged affection for each other that went beyond politics. You have a very good line in the book, I thought, that as a partisan himself, Lincoln had a partisan's contempt for opposing partisans. Very well put, I must say. Which is not the, link, the mythical Abraham and Stephen you know, flirting with Mary and may the better man win, and it's not like that at all. Oh, no, no. For one thing, these two really were political partisans. And going back to the earliest days of their political careers, uh, when they both go to the Illinois legislature in the 1830s, Lincoln goes as a deeply committed Whig. One of his law partners, Stephen, Whig, Stephen Logan, said that he never knew a man to be so strong, so stiff in his Whig doctrines as Abraham Lincoln. But by the same token, Stephen A. Douglas was a fervid Jacksonian Democrat. In fact, when he is elected to Congress, it is Stephen A. Douglas who makes the motion, makes the speech, uh, asking Congress to refund to Andrew Jackson, who's still alive at that point, but to refund Andrew Jackson the fine that was levied on him by federal judge Dominic Hall 
for the imposition of martial law in New Orleans in 1814 to 15. Uh, Douglas is the one who's responsible for that legislation. When Douglas visits Old Hickory at the Hermitage, um, Jackson invites Douglas to sit down beside him. Are you the man that sponsored that legislation that vindicated me? Oh, yes, I am, sir. Well, I want you to sit right here beside me. It was almost as though there was a, a passing of the mantle from Andrew Jackson to Stephen A. Douglas, or at least that was the way Douglas liked to think about it. So Douglas is very <coughs> fervid in his loyalty to the Jacksonian Democratic Party. So these two are, are polarized. But don't you think by, there's by also their, by their personal politics. antipathy between them? There is also personal I think antipathy. I mean, for one thing, Lincoln writes a memorandum in 1856. And it's a very surprising memorandum when we're always thinking about Lincoln as the man of malice toward none and charity for all, because the big exception to that formula was Stephen A. Douglas. Uh, Lincoln writes a memorandum about Douglas, and this is in addition to, uh, to years of snarky comments about Douglas. He once referred to Douglas as, Douglas is the least man I ever saw. <laughs> Douglas is such a small matter that we should ignore him. Mm -hmm. You know, things like that. Um, but he, in 1856, writes this little memorandum in which he talks about himself and Douglas. He says, we started out the race of life together some 20 years ago. Douglas, oh, Douglas has had everything handed to him in life. Everything's come to him on a silver platter. Judgeship, state's attorney, Congress, Senate, leadership of his party. One day he'll be president of the United States. And me, poor Abraham Lincoln, well, I haven't really accomplished very, very much. And you, and you see what's burning there is Lincoln is convinced. That is wrong. I deserve mm -hmm. to, to have this. I worked hard, and I didn't get rewarded, whereas Douglas, who hardly seems to have worked at all, gets all the rewards. And he says, his life is unfair. And, and you're surprised to read that from Lincoln, but there was that that was really burning away uh, on a slow burn inside Lincoln. So this match between Lincoln and Douglas, yes, it's political, it, and it's very politically partisan. But at the same time, it's also got a very nasty personal edge to it. It never becomes publicly nasty. It never becomes savage. But there is a definite edge to what both of these candidates have to say well, it's to each a, other. It's, it does get fairly nasty when you're talking about someone not supporting soldiers in a war, when you're accusing someone of selling liquor. And that's, that's, you should repeat, tell them that exchange, which is the best uh, alcoholism story of the camp of the camp and it's early, right? <laughs> it's, it's early. It's 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 fairly early in the camp because Douglas at one point begins uh, one of the debates, and I believe it is the Ottawa debate. Yeah, I think it's the first. Uh, Douglas begins by paying compliment to Abraham Lincoln. I've known Abraham Lincoln for many years. Uh, he's a very nice gentleman. He's very persuasive. I remember when he used to sell liquor uh, behind uh, the bar in the grocery store. In the Great Hollow or something. Oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, Lincoln, when he had an opportunity to respond, said, yes, yes, I did run a grocery store. I didn't really sell liquor, but if I had, Stephen A. Douglas would have been the best customer. <laughs> <laughs> I think you actually improved the line a little, a little bit. bit it's a yes, just, yes. It's but, modern cadence, I think. But uh, you know, there, is, there is this back yeah. and forth. But they, they don't really become nasty with each other. If you want to see people become nasty, watch some of the other legislative debates between legislative candidates in Illinois. Uh, there was one in northern Illinois where a Republican candidate and a Democratic candidate really got into a shouting match and it ended by the one candidate slugging the other and knocking them off the platform. So it, it doesn't quite get to those dimensions with Lincoln and Douglas, but there is an edge there. Well, let's, I'm going to just set ask, we, we can both do this, set, we've now talked about Lincoln and Douglas as partisans and talked about their dueling personalities, their dueling appearances. It's really a match that a Hollywood uh, casting a director could not have done a better job of, of placing characters. But now, back to the political culture. We talked about, um, we, we should mention, I mean, there is a fervent desire for people to participate in these events. Oh, good 